Forget Mars. You've heard it all before. The bold visions, the billion-dollar plans, the promises of turning our red neighbor into humanity's second home. But the truth is simple. Mars is not a second Earth. And chances are, it never will be. For decades, space agencies, billionaires, and science fiction writers have imagined cities on the red planet. But here's the reality. Mars is a dead world that's actively hostile to life. The atmosphere will boil your blood. The radiation will damage your brain. The dust will clog your lungs. And that's before you try to grow food, find water, or survive a winter. We're not moving to Mars. Not in 10 years. Not in a hundred. Maybe not ever. This isn't pessimism. It's physics, biology, and engineering. In this video, we're going to walk through why Mars colonization remains one of the most persistent illusions in modern science, and why exploring Mars is still worth it, even if we never live there. Mars isn't waiting for us, it's killing us. Let's start with the basics. Mars is not almost habitable, it's almost space. The atmospheric pressure at the surface is less than 1% of Earth's, that means if you stepped outside without a pressurized suit, your blood would start to boil, literally. Not from heat, but because low pressure causes bodily fluids to vaporize. You'd lose consciousness in under 15 seconds. Death follows within a minute. No drama, just physics. And even if you're inside a habitat? Radiation is a permanent threat. Mars has no global magnetic field and only a thin layer of atmosphere. That leaves you exposed to constant cosmic radiation and solar particle events. The current estimates suggest surface levels of radiation are at least 50 times higher than on Earth. For a colonist, that means higher cancer risk, cognitive decline, and long-term organ damage, even inside a shelter. Then there's the temperature. The average is around minus 63 degrees Celsius, or minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. At the poles, it can drop to minus 125 degrees Celsius. Add to that the global dust storms that can last for months and block out the sun entirely. And the dust itself? It's toxic. Mars dust contains perchlorates a class of chemicals that disrupt the thyroid and damage human tissues. These particles are small enough to infiltrate machinery, spacesuits, and lungs. Put simply, Mars doesn't support life. It erodes it. The False Hope of Planet B The idea of Mars as a backup plan for Earth is emotionally appealing and scientifically misleading. There's a dangerous fantasy in thinking that we can just move to Mars if Earth becomes unlivable. But if we're truly worried about the survival of our species, investing in Earth's resilience makes far more sense. Why? Because Earth, even damaged, is still a habitable planet. It has breathable air, a working biosphere, a magnetic field, water, gravity that matches our physiology. You could heat the poles of Earth and still have a better survival chance than inside a Martian dome. Look at Biosphere 2, a sealed habitat experiment in Arizona designed to simulate space colony conditions. Even on Earth, with gravity, sunlight, and a breathable outside world, the experiment nearly failed. Oxygen levels dropped. Food production collapsed. Psychological tensions escalated and that was with full support from nearby teams and infrastructure. So before imagining self-sustaining Martian cities, ask this. Why haven't we built a self-sustaining city in Antarctica yet, or under the sea? Both environments are far easier, and yet we've done almost nothing with them. The comparison matters, because if we can't live in extreme places on Earth, we're not ready for Mars. Human limits, radiation, reproduction, and gravity. Let's talk biology. Even if we built perfectly sealed, temperature-controlled habitats on Mars, we'd still be facing unavoidable physiological stress. 
start with radiation. Studies on astronauts, animals, and biological tissues show that high radiation environments don't just increase cancer risk, they affect the brain, the heart, the immune system, and even DNA repair mechanisms. According to a 2024 study published by researchers at Duke University, colonists on Mars would likely suffer a 15 to 20 year reduction in life expectancy due to cumulative radiation exposure, even with shielding. Now add gravity. Mars has only 38% of Earth's gravity. That's not enough to maintain bone density, muscle mass, or cardiovascular function. Astronauts returning from months in microgravity already suffer from vision problems, immune dysfunction, and prolonged recovery. We still don't know what happens after years in partial gravity, but the signs aren't good. Then, there's reproduction. Studies between 2022 and 2024 showed that mammalian embryos in microgravity often failed to develop normally. The skeletal, neural, and circulatory systems rely on gravitational cues during development. Dr. Varsha Jain, a space medicine expert, warns that human reproduction in Martian gravity may be impossible without artificial intervention. So not only might we fail to raise children on Mars, we may not even be able to conceive them safely. And even if a child were born healthy on Mars, their body would be adapted to Martian gravity. Bringing them back to Earth later could cause organ collapse or fatal trauma due to the increased stress on their bones, heart, and circulation. In other words, colonists might survive, but they wouldn't thrive, and their children might never see Earth. The Cost of Everyday Survival Let's assume we overcome all the radiation and reproduction issues. What about just staying alive? Mars has no easy access to food, water, or breathable air. Everything has to be brought from Earth or manufactured using local resources through complex, failure-prone systems. Take water. While there's ice on Mars, especially near the poles, most of it is mixed with perchlorates or deeply buried. Extracting, purifying, and storing it requires vast energy. And you'll need it not just for drinking, but for growing food, generating oxygen, and recycling waste. Solar panels are less effective on Mars, producing about 40% less energy than on Earth. Worse, during dust storms, output can drop to near zero for weeks. And batteries? Still nowhere near efficient enough for full energy autonomy. A recent MIT study estimated that a single Martian colonist would require 50 metric tons of equipment and materials shipped from Earth just to survive. Even oxygen production is a challenge. The MOXIE experiment on the Perseverance rover extracted 12 grams of oxygen per hour. That's not even 3% of what a single person needs per day. Scaling that up for a crew of humans, with redundancy and storage, requires technology we simply don't have yet. And food? Martian soil is toxic and lacks organic nutrients. Crops will need to be grown in sealed hydroponic systems with artificial lighting, powered by limited energy supplies. These systems will be fragile, expensive, and heavily dependent on Earth for spare parts. A single system failure could mean starvation, or suffocation, or both. Terraforming is a sci-fi mirage. When the conversation gets tough, some dreamers change the topic. What if we just terraform Mars? Let's be clear, this is science fiction. Terraforming Mars would require manipulating an entire planet's atmosphere, pressure, temperature, and magnetic field. That's not decades away. That's thousands of years away, if it's even possible at all. A 2023 report by the United Nations Space Climate Observatory concluded that with all currently foreseeable technology, it would take at least 10,000 years to make Mars marginally breathable. And even then, without a magnetic field to protect it, any atmosphere we create would be slowly stripped away by solar wind, just like the original Martian atmosphere was. Some of the solutions being proposed sound like plot lines from a comic book giant orbital mirrors to melt the poles, 
nuclear bombs to release CO2, redirecting ammonia-rich asteroids to trigger warming. All of these ideas share one thing in common. They're technologically unfeasible, environmentally unstable, and unbelievably dangerous. Even if they worked, which they wouldn't, the ethics of altering another planet's climate on a planetary scale without full understanding are staggering. Terraforming is not a solution. It's a fantasy. Post-humans on Mars. At this point, you might think, what if we adapted ourselves to Mars instead of adapting Mars to us? That's a more realistic proposition and also a deeply unsettling one. Scientists have already started experimenting with genetic modifications that could one day allow humans to survive in harsher environments. In 2024, researchers in China integrated tardigrade genes into mouse embryos to increase radiation resistance. Other labs are developing human cells with enhanced DNA repair mechanisms. In theory, we could engineer Martian humans with thicker skin, enhanced oxygen extraction, altered cardiovascular systems, and skeletal structures adapted for low gravity. But at that point, are they still human? Dr. Jennifer Dudna, CRISPR pioneer, has warned that modifying the human genome for space colonization crosses a line. We wouldn't just be enhancing survival, she said. We'd be designing a new species. That may sound exciting to some, but it comes with profound ethical consequences. Who decides what the Martian genome looks like? Who gets modified? What happens if we get it wrong? And even if we succeed, the result wouldn't be humanity on Mars. It would be something else. Something after us. Why temporary outposts make sense. Here's the good news. Mars exploration is still entirely within reach. We can build research bases temporary outposts modeled after Antarctica stations. We can send astronauts for months at a time, rotate them out, and learn how to operate in harsh planetary environments. We can construct orbiting platforms around Mars that support remote missions with robotic assets. This incremental approach already works. The Perseverance rover has done more for Martian science than any human could, and it cost a fraction of what a crewed mission would require. The Ingenuity helicopter, originally a technology demo, became a game-changing scout that proved powered flight is possible on another planet. We should build on these successes, invest in better propulsion, develop closed-loop life support, study radiation shielding and autonomous systems, and yes, someday, send astronauts. But not to live there. Not yet. First, to study Mars, to understand it and to return home. Earth is still our only home. The reality is simple. Mars is not our second home. It's an alien world designed by nature to be uninhabitable. No breathable air, no natural protection, no reliable food, water, or energy. It is an engineering nightmare and a biological hazard. Will we one day build permanent outposts there? Maybe. Will we terraform it? Highly unlikely. Will we ever live there in large numbers, raise families and build cities? Not in this century, and maybe not in any. And that's okay. Because this idea, that we need to move to Mars to survive, has always been backward. Earth isn't broken yet. And if we can't fix Earth, we won't survive anywhere else. The dream of Mars colonization may persist, but for now, it belongs in the realm of exploration, not relocation. As Carl Sagan said, for the moment, Earth remains the only known world that harbors life. There is no other place, at least in the near future, where our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. And that's perfectly fine. Mars will still be there if we ever do become ready. Thanks for watching. If you're ready to explore further, don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Join us at Astro Vault. Your gateway to the stars begins here.